I have a new computer. This is a Scion 3A organizer from about 1995. It is a 8088 based machine with this model, 256K of RAM. Uh, it's one of the rare Intel architecture machines that doesn't run DOS. It's got a simple but very effective multitasking operating system with a bunch of different productivity apps, including a word processor, spreadsheet, etc., including a if I can find it, including a complete integrated development kit for writing your own programs, which was quite unusual in those days and quite unusual these days either, sadly. Now, I actually have two of these. The one on the left is the 256K model. The one on the right is the one megabyte model. And as you might be able to tell, the one megabyte model has a little problem with the screen. Let's start up the word processor. You can see only the top half works. Now, I'd much rather have a working one megabyte model than two to six K model. And these things use essentially the same screen. So what I'm going to try to do today is to swap the screen from this machine onto this machine and vice versa. So I get a working one megabyte one and a non-working 256k one. And this will be a little bit of an adventure because these things were notoriously interestingly put together. Anyway, let's start with the one megabyte model because it's actually broken. So I'll put this one to the side. So this one used to belong to somebody, it's labelled It's Pride 2, and then a code. Who knows? It is mine now. So the first thing is to remove the batteries. These things would run off a couple of double A's for double digit hours. And of course being double A's they're easy to find and easy to charge. I do not believe you could actually recharge them in the machine itself, or that it have a main socket. The other thing we need to remove is the backup battery. These machines largely predated... Oops, that came up very effectively. These machines largely predated flash, so this has battery back RAM rather than uh, anything non-volatile. And... Okay, let's start removing some of the obvious screws and seeing what happens. Now there's two ways I can do this. One is to uh, remove the front panel of the screen and then take the LCD off and replace it like that. And the other is to replace the entire lid assembly. Now it would be easier, given these things notoriously interesting hinges, you can see the rather elegant engineering there, it would be easier to remove the screen. However, that ribbon cable here, I don't know whether it's got a plug on the screen end. So if I were to get the screen out and realize that I can't actually unplug it, that won't help much. So I'm actually going to do some general purpose disassembly first. So let's try removing this. These machines were much beloved and you can still find them now and again in people's pockets these days. They were designed to be usable above anything else. So the fairly low grade specs didn't really matter and their productivity suite, the onboard software was excellent, as well as having the ability to write your own programs. And it was a first class development environment. You could write the same sort of apps that the native programs were yourself on one of these. 
meant that there was a flourishing ecosystem of there we go. Back to the battery compartment. The flourishing ecosystem of third party software. It was so successful that Scion actually had quite a lot of trouble getting people to upgrade to new models, which was one reason why Scion is no longer with us. That battery plug needs to come out. That I will need. My trusty bent nose pliers. Hmm. tougher than it should be. I'd rather not break anything, you see. There we go. And that goes to the side. So what's this given us? Not a lot. But you can see more of the, the details of the hinge mechanism. And I can actually see inside to the motherboard here, and there is a plug that end. Is there a plug this end? I cannot honestly see one. So the question here is, do I start removing this panel? Because to get at the screen, you have to peel this thing off. Or do I go for the back. One thing I'm rather dreading is I will remove the wrong screw and the entire hinge mechanism will go ping and springs will go everywhere. I'll probably never get it back together. Let's try the back panel. Screw here. Need a bigger screwdriver for that one. I never actually had one of these back in the day. I was a Acorn fanboy, and Acorn did actually produce their own branded models of these. So I knew of them, but I never owned one. I would probably have liked it quite a lot. The ability to write their own programs on the go would have appealed to me. This, by the way, is the warranty void if removed sticker. I reckon the warranty in this machine is now well and truly gone. That is the wrong kind of screwdriver. Although I grew up on BBC Basic and the, the built-in language called OPL was basic-like, but I never really liked it much. It's perfectly functional. You can write decent apps on it. Okay. Screws on the side so don't lose them. Now, what have we got? Not much, really. Ah, that's removing the keyboard. So I need my trusty spudger. Makes the keyboard come out. Ooh, this looks like a rubber mat to me. not look like it's going to come out easily. I think there's another piece I'm uh, missing. I also think it might not be helping me. Because I'm still going to have to do these blasted hinges in order to get the thing out. To get the lid off. Do I need to remove the button bar first? 
I did look for like instructions online, couldn't find any. These two panels here are for the solid state storage, not SD cards. They came out about the same year as this did. It was its own proprietary format. It was actually, the cards were intelligent and they had their own microcontrollers and they spoke the same networking protocol that the device itself used to talk to the outside world via this terrible little connector here. I really don't know what they were thinking there. So you can, in fact, take one of the SD cards with a simple adapter and plug it into the thing that you use to connect these to a PC. And then the PC accesses the card as if it was a Scion. It was very neat. Naturally, they are dead and gone today. No one knows the details of the protocols or anything. There's very little technical information on these. Yeah, I don't think that's helped. So let's put this back together. Uh, let's go back together. Interesting. That's the back of the keyboard PCB. Ain't happy. This is why I started the broken one, you see. These clips should clip on. Why aren't they clipping? Ah, very simple. Just needed more force. Okay, right, that doesn't seem to work very well, so. Now I want to know whether it's possible to remove to work from the screen side. See, this is the sticky label that forms the front panel to the LCD. I'm going to make a wild guess that there is in fact a plug in there. So let's just try going into the front. Now, this is going to be kind of problematic. So I don't really want to bend the, bend or distort this sticky thing, but it has to peel off. Glued stuff. Why do people glue stuff? Why can't this just have a nice straightforward set of clips? This way. I don't think this is working either. Let me think of that. Moving the hinge assembly might be the way to go. Yeah. I can probably peel that off, but I think I'll just wreck it beyond repair. So, there's a couple of screws here. I wonder what they do. Of course, we have to do this all again with the other one.
They were designed to be repairable, but... And I've found people online who've taken this 256K model and actually sold it on Circus Mount Ram chips. And now I think of it, I think the person who described doing that did not actually end up with a working Scion 3, so that's probably not a recommendation. Now, what did that do? Not a lot. I am still of the opinion now that actually going through the keyboard is the way to go. So why weren't, wasn't the keyboard coming loose here? Anyway, let's give this another go. That unclips easily enough. So is it hooked into something in the back? The front? Ah! Oh, that was it. That was easy. Uh, it was the button bar here is uh, this thing has these four screws which hold the button bar flat. Without the screws, it's bendy, and it's not. It was catching the top of the keyboard grill. So this is the keyboard rubber mat. Underneath is the main board. It's not screwed on with anything, which is interesting. So it should just lift up with a bit of force. It does, and the other side has got. Oh, this is not the main board. This is just the keyboard. There's a connector here. Does that pull out? Something's going on in there. It's connected to that weird connector here. Some, but it must fasten down to the main PCB somewhere. Uh, fasten down. There must be a connection. I think that's in here. There's a spring. Ah, no, this, this is the main board. You, there's a plug here onto the this board at the bottom. That's how it connects on. Right. Well, I can see the bottom of the LCD and yes, there are plugs, so I can get that off here. So I technically don't even have to remove this, but I want to. But I can see there's a hole in the PCB just down there, and a spring hooks through it. So I can... That. Right, easy. And there is the spring. Ah, it's the spring that holds this connector on. Right, well that's 
elegantly small. Yep. Uh, here are the two RAM chips. This is where the other two RAM chips would go. The main board for the one megabyte model will have more stuff on it. And I think I've just solved my problem. I don't need to dissemble any more than this. All I need to do is to replace the main board. The I can keep the hang on, this is the one megabyte version. So what are these two for? I don't know. I can swap the main boards and swap the keyboard skins because these have the all important one megabyte RAM label and I don't need to touch anything else. All right, that is worth knowing. So let's put all these things aside because these are all belong to one machine. And then let's tackle the other one, our donor. We do all the same things, remove the batteries. Actually, now that I know slightly more what I'm doing, let's just try diving in on the keyboard. Oh, we need back battery first. Because it's possible I don't need to do any of the other stuff. It's a very energetic spring on that thing. Okay. Love to stick this onto something more deserving, but there's a security label it's designed not to come off easily. For heaven's sake. Just ignore it. So that it captures the screw, the screw quite nicely, and let's unclip this. So, that comes off, and it's the same model of keyboard, there are apparently two. Here is our PCB, which is unplugged from the screen nicely. It's kind of curved, which I'm not expecting. Now, ah, the bug here is caught in the There we go. What's going on here? Oh, uh, that's the battery connector. I forgot I'd unplugged that on the other one. That's actually a good reason to go through the back of this, but... Right. Okay. Right. So this is all the stuff from the 256K model. Right, this is all working. So let us insert the motherboard from the one meg version. Oh dear. That may should have been attached to the board. Let's insert this into our donor machine. Let me insert it the right way up. Yes, actually, this horrible sprung thing is horrible and sprung. There we go. Put this on like that. So that goes in here somehow. 
going to be a... What holds this together? Lock? A case? Sheer bloody mindedness? Okay. Let's plug in the battery connector first. So, not too hard. That hooks into the hole here, and this very delicately gets forced crudely into the slot here. Very little is known about these machines when it comes to hardware. So you can't emulate one. Nobody knows how they work. It's all custom chips. The core of this thing is... Uh, actually, I can show you on this board. The core of this thing is this enormous unit, which is a custom Scion ASIC. I think it's even got the processor in it. I could be wrong. I don't see anything else that looks like a processor. And it's a huge chip full of all kinds of custom logic and it's got all the all the hardware access stuff and a memory management unit. And there we go. And it's just a mystery. I've seen a little bit of reverse engineering online, but not much. So if you want to use one of these, you kind of have to do it with real hardware. That seems suspiciously easy. Let's stick some batteries in it and see what happens. To turn it on, you need the keyboard. Because the battery's been out, all its memory's wiped, so what comes out? Fantastic, we have a full screen. Okay, menu. Yeah. Is there a system? Oh, I'm in the I'm in the contacts app. I want this one, the main menu. There we go. Control, special, there we go, memory. Free, 871K, brilliant. Okay, let's turn this off, take the batteries out again, and quickly put it back together before I break something. Firstly, clip on the keyboard, and this be the right one, this is the one megabyte version. Clips here. That is. So this has to hook underneath the hinges. And then this one working on it. Okay. And the keyboard membrane goes underneath. clips together. Now we know the secret is brute force, that's easy. That 
it's not clipping. So I would demonstrate doing something interesting with one of these, but I'm actually still missing. I don't have any of the uh, the specialist adapters needed to plug them into modern hardware, or a memory card for that matter. So doing something with documents is always fiddly. Plus. Oh, come on, what's wrong with this thing? Plus, these machines are actually a little bit too modern to be interesting to program for. I mean, OPL is a interesting, if slightly weird, language. Ah! What's happened here? is it's this captive screw. So that's in fact, yeah, there we go. Now that the lid's open, the screw pushes up when I push the keyboard. So let's just, let's just rip off this stupid label. Which is now disintegrating around me. So yeah, I mean, what could I do on this? I could write documents using the built-in apps, which is interesting enough, I suppose. Try to write a simple game in OPL. It's not that exciting. Backup battery, close lid. So it's real batteries, back on. And make sure it still works. One thing I have been looking forward to with this one, you know, the backup battery is still dead. Assuming I put it in the right way up. One thing I have been looking forward to is that this this model has some extra programs. It has a bigger ROM than the 256K, which includes this patience application for all your solitaire needs. No idea what to do with jokers. Which uh, I haven't actually I had a chance to play with. Ooh, sound effects. It advertises here 16 bit CPU, multitasking, digital audio system, which was, to be fair, quite novel back then. This is not a version of Patience, I know. Uh, we need an eight, maybe. Eight. I have no idea how that works. And never mind. Let's just take that backup battery. Yeah, it is the right way up. It must just be flat. It'd be years old. And let's start putting this one back together again. Now, while it's a part, have a quick look at what's left. So underneath this shield, there should actually be very little. There's just this one board here. This has got connectors for the LCD on it, and I can just see underneath there a speaker for the digital audio system. So I wonder what's underneath the shield. It's fastened on with tape. Doesn't feel like there's anything in there, but I do see a couple of connectors here and here. Yeah, it's a 
sticky security label. Oh, it's the connectors for the card slots. Right, the cards slide in here. They are huge. It would actually be entirely feasible to build a SD card adapter. You could fit a complete SD card in one of these things. I mean, not a micro SD card, an old fashioned SD card. These things are kind of enormous. But that is out of scope for this video. Now, oh, how does this thing go together? That goes in there. Tiny plastic. Yeah, that's awful. Flimsy as hell. Why didn't they just use an ordinary connector? It's only six pins, for heaven's sake. They're designing their own. I mean, this is just based on a motherboard header. It's as cheap as everything. Oh, now I think of it. Back then, there weren't very many bespoke connectors, bespoke multi-pin connectors. It was before uh, USB. So the alternatives would have been something like a, uh, a D socket, like a old fashioned serial port or motherboard or video, VGA video. So maybe there just wasn't anything else. That's why they built their own. Plugs back on. Very nice, satisfying action. The way it clips onto the the internal sockets. And keyboard goes on top there. And that's interesting. What's this? That's a button. There's a hidden button which you access by pressing this. That must be a reset switch. Well, let's not play with that. First I need to put this back on, which involves plugging this in here. Hook the wire underneath its little retainer. Apparently OPL, the built-in programming language in these things, is now open source. So, given that it was designed for these PDAs, I wonder whether it might be a reasonable fit for Android. Of course, the keyboards on these were dramatically better than anything on a modern phone. This pushes onto the keyboard here. So, yeah. 
That will not, in fact, do up until I put this on. There's nothing for it to screw into. Um, and I have two more black screws left, and these go... Oh, I'm an idiot. These go into the lid, and they're inside here, so I have to remove this again. After the various Scion 3s, Scion produced the 5, which was the first modern Epoch device. Epoch later turned into Symbian, and for a while it ruled mobile phones as the operating system that everyone used. They rewrote the OS that these things run entirely and adopted this, this new processor from ARM. And those machines are very, very well thought of. They're about the same size as a, one of these threes, maybe a little bit bigger, with an even nicer keyboard. And the, the, the keyboard in these threes is not bad in any way. It's a small, but very, very effective and combine that with a faster 32-bit processor and a more sophisticated operating system, stuff like preemptive multitasking. Um, I think I've stripped that thread, never mind. The 5 was really the machine that made everyone sit up and take notice of Scion. In some ways it was also the machine that killed them, as people bought us bought a Scion 5 and then didn't buy anything else. I have a 5, which at some point I'll get out and demonstrate. I also have one of the five successors, the Scion Netbook. The Netbook was the original Netbook. This is the one that coined the name. Scion were extremely unhappy when the name became generic for any small notebook machine. But the Scion Netbook ran Epoch, it was another ARM-based machine, it had a full-size keyboard, a small but excellent screen, it was, a, uh, it, it was a good machine in many ways. 32 megabytes of RAM, it ran Epoch, and it didn't have any Wi-Fi or anything. All these machines predate, like, the internet. So there's not a lot you can do with it these days, which is a real shame, I like it a great deal. to do his boot. Yeah, I can see the screen is divided into two. The bottom is not working. Hello? Anyone? There we go. So let's now push the mysterious button and see what happens. It went blank. It's a hardware off button, that's all it is. Yeah, if, if your machine goes nuts then and stops responding to the normal off key off sequence, which is uh, function one, then you can push that and the machine shuts down. Useful to know. It's probably even in the manual, which I actually have somewhere. No, you can't run Linux on one of these. You can run Linux on the 5, the big brother, and you can certainly run it on the 7. I did for a while, but it's only got 62 megs of RAM, and you're not really going to get anything useful done in that. I wrote on it for a while using a simple text editor, but it wasn't really a success. Come on.
Also, it's not a touch screen. So, ooh, now that's interesting. The bottom half of the screen is flickering on. When I put pressure on the board. Shouldn't really be working with this while it's turned on, but that was really interesting to notice. Because that suggests that whatever's wrong with the screen is fixable. Anyway. Let's put in our screws. Because if I can turn this into, instead of one functional, one non-functional machine, if I can turn that into two functional machines, that'd be awesome. communication with the outside world for these things was through the proprietary connector. Later ones had infrared. I don't think any of these ever had Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi was still very much in its infancy, even in the very, very later days of the five. And while my netbook, if you have the right add-on card, does support Wi-Fi, it doesn't actually support any useful encryption standards, so it's like WEP. I wouldn't wish WEP on anyone. That's really interesting. Anyway. Put that aside and check the good one out again. Make sure it still works. Yep. What have we got here? Oh, the world map. Can I tell it where I am? Here in Switzerland. Uh, is it home city? Is it home to Zurich? Yes. Right, Zurich is zero miles away. Useful to know. I have relatives who live in Cairns, if I type in, doesn't know Cairns, it wants me to go to Cairo instead. Let's try Brisbane. Yep. And things flashing there. Brisbane is 10,082 miles away. Miles, miles, change distance units to kilometers. 16,226 kilometers. Good to know. Also, the time is apparently 17.05 there, which I suspect is wrong. Let's go back up to system, menu. There's date and time. Battery info here. Main batteries are good. Backup battery needs replacing, not an external power. Ah, I better set the clock for the time app, which is here. And it thinks it is 4.27 p.m. My trusty Pebble thinks it's 
five. So time and date. There you go. Fifteen fifty-five. Right. Won't let me type in fifteen. Even early MS DOS would do that. And it is the seventh of October. It's not 1993. It is 2018. Okay, is that the 7th of October or is that the 10th of July? It's the 10th of July. The first one is the month. 10, 07, 2018. Right. I can change that. If I go to menu, I can then go down to hit formats. Date format. Month, day, year. Day, month, year. Year, month, day. Hyphen, the way the gods intended. 24 hours, the way the gods intended. There we go. It still thinks it's 12.55. Interesting. Set to date. It is 15. Right, that, that's more correct. Fantastic. Got a calculator. Two plus two is four. It's good to have confirmation of these things. Word processor. The keyboard is small. You're not going to touch type on this. You notice I have not typing a file name. It just remembers. I can name stuff later if I want to. Spreadsheet. Yes. Two. Two. Equals a one plus a two is four. So you get these shortcut buttons to specific applications or system will take you to the system application where you can browse the actual um, menus. Some of these are in bold because those are applications that are currently running. It is a multitasking operating system. So if we go back to the word processor, hit menu, Save as name test onto the internal disk. If we go back to system, you can see I now have a named document there. Uh, data is not the file manager, that's just a card app. It may not be a file manager. I think you're supposed to manage files through the applications here. So if I want to find my document, I can just go down here to test and it will load it, reload it in this case. I can create a new document. Right, it doesn't like file names with spaces in. I'll just call that another. system. So I have two documents loaded. I can go to test. I can go to another. The application itself will only support one at a time, but it will seamlessly switch between them. Yeah, it's a nice system. Everything's workable through control hotkeys, so once you get used to it, it's very fast. Yeah. Anyway, I need to figure out the rules for this. It's probably in the manual somewhere. That'll be a while. Anyway, we now have a working Scion 3 and a mostly working Scion 3. Hope you enjoyed this.